This is Richard Wolf. Welcome to All Things Co-op, a podcast by Democracy at Work. Uh, welcome to another uh, episode of All Things Co-op. I'm Chinar, uh, one of your co-hosts, and with me, as always, is Kevin and Larry. Howdy, howdy. Um, and today we're really excited to have uh, Michael Leibowitz on the show. Uh, Michael is a professor emeritus of economics at Simon Fraser University in Vancouver, Canada, and the author of several books, including The Socialist Imperative, and the contradictions of real socialism. He was director, program in transformative practice and human development, Centro Internacional Miranda in Caracas, Venezuela from 2006 to 2011. Uh, welcome to the show, Michael. Uh, happy to be here. Great, great. So one of the first questions I had to kind of kick off uh, the session is that um, you've obviously written a lot about um, a socialist alternative to the capitalist system in which we live in. Um, one question I had about that is, what is the importance of uh, worker co-ops and communes in the transition to a socialist alternative? And how do those two entities uh, uh, support one another and reinforce one another? Well, I should you know, start by simply s stressing an element that's been in many of my works, um, which is the centrality of protagonism, um, the absolute necessity for people to engage in activity, and in doing so, they develop their capacities. This is an idea that went back, you know, to, well, certainly uh, in Marx, where he talks about what he calls revolutionary practice, which is the simultaneous change in circumstances and human activity or self-development. Um, and that concept is one that I think is absolutely central um, because it does point to the importance of people working together and developing trust and developing um, a sense of their a pride in, in their ability to carry on things. Um, so in that respect, um, I was always attracted for that reason to workers co-ops or working workers control. Um, and when I was a you know the policy director of the New Democratic Party in, in British Columbia um, in the 70s, um, we made a point of emphasizing the absolute importance of opening the books of companies, transparency, and also um, worker councils that would in fact be have access to the book and to make de decisions on their own. Um, so, in so in in, the, in that context, I think cooperatives, uh, workers' councils, workers' control are absolutely central for being able to develop the capacities to build a new society, um, and that's true in co-op the activity that occurs in cooperatives, um, but also in communal councils with which um, we became very familiar. Um, in during with uh, during the period of our stay in in Venezuela, um, and certainly even though I theoretically um, had the sense of the importance of protagonism and worker councils and communal councils, there I could see it absolutely in practice. Um, mm -hmm. I, I worked especially with a number of cooperatives that had basically taken over um, the firms from below that mm -hmm. they were in and how they functioned you know, in, in directing the firms, a, a mixed situation. Um, and also at the same time, um, we saw especially the way in which people developed in the communal councils um, and took so much pride in what they were able to do by working together. Mm -hmm. So I think those things are absolutely essential. They're important in that respect with respect to changing people's sense of themselves 
but at the same time, um, they are they have limits because they develop in the context of a capitalist society, um, and that brings a number of you know potential problems, um, which I've seen not only in Venezuela but also when I was studying uh, the Yugoslav self-management situation. So. Well, I just I was wondering, uh, we did an episode, I think, a while ago about the, uh, it was a, the takeover, uh, where we talked about the, take, you know, in Argentina. And one of the interesting things in some of the reading we did, I don't know how strongly we emphasized it, but that um, there were pretty established unions that they were tied into the the government in a lot of ways and they weren't that supportive that's not where the big takeover had happened it happened a lot spontaneously it's almost like uh you know uh spontaneous takeovers really a lot and they did it in smaller sectors you know in smaller enterprises too a lot of times uh what's your sense of i don't know uh where to place this geographically this question but um is there an inherent conflict, do you think, between uh, unions doing what they do and uh, an activist co-op, an activist organization of workers that wants to try a co-op or take over a business and turn it into a co-op? Can they do it without union help in this country, or can they uh, cooperate with unions? And then what would be the basis of that? Uh, are they kind of, do you see... <laughs> You don't have to say, I know, you know, if you've had any experience with it, share with us your experience. Let me put it that way. If you haven't, then, you know, we, we talked about it a bit, but uh, you mentioned uh, from the bottom up like that, it, it rang a bell with me. Well, you know, um, the, the important thing I think to understand is that cooperatives or any kind of institution don't drop from the sky. They yeah. emerge in a particular context with particular social relations that are already present. Um, the experience we had, for example, in Venezuela with state companies, um, at which Chavez encouraged to engage in, have worker control, workers elect the president, et cetera. Um, those companies, you know, where there were these initiatives, a very strong feeling uh, for the importance of workers' councils, and the few cases I'm thinking of, were sabotaged by the economistic trade unions. They uh -huh. did not, in, they had no interest in um, worker management. They, in fact, were strongly antagonistic, um, and what they were interested in was wages. Yeah. Wages and hours of work. Um, and anything that you know, seemed to, you know, go contrary to that or reduce their power within the particular workplaces um, were challenged. And in one case, the, the uh, aluminum firm Alcasa, they in fact blocked the entry of the workers' council people into the factory. Um, so very, very problematic in that it particular case. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, so how did that play I don't, out? I don't think there's anything inherent you know, that if you had a progressive, strongly socially oriented trade union, um, right. that would not necessarily move in the, you know, contrary to workers' management, but um, that that's the necessary condition. Um, on the other hand, you know, as long as I'm talking about Venezuela, I can tell you that, you know, what, many of the cases of, of takeovers in Venezuela occurred because the firms that engaged in the lockout uh, against, you know, Chavez's government, uh, many of them, in fact, you know, if they thought it would just last a you know, week or so and the government would be gone, uh, yeah, many yeah. It went on for, for months and many of them, in fact, went broke. Right. So you had workers who had been promised that they would receive wages all the time that the companies were closed, call, basically striking and setting picket lines in order to avoid the companies selling the machinery in there. Yeah. And yeah. in some cases, several cases, there were cooperative groups of people who took over the, the plants. Now, here's the story, you know, and this is a sad story in some cases. Um, what you had it was a situation in which these um, 
you know, these companies would ask, the, the workers would ask the government to take over the company. Um, and the government worked out a mechanism, the, the labor minister with whom I had disagreed on this point, which would be 51% ownership by the state, 49% by the cooperative of workers. Um, this was a problematic you know, um, way of dealing with this. Um, and what happened in one case um, that I was quite familiar with is that the cooperative started to, you know, production again, but many of the people who had occupied the plant who formed now the cooperative were, you know, many of them were not working there, were not part of the, the occupation because in the period they went off and got different jobs. Mm. So how did they come back to the firm? They came back as um, wage laborers working for the cooperative. Um, at one meeting, um, the the uh, president of the this co-op, this was uh, uh, Invapal, um, said, "All right, we have forty nine percent of the rent. We should have ninety nine percent, and let the government just have the one percent." Um, and that was indicative of where they were going, because what happened was when the people were working as wage laborers for the smaller group that had occupied, which was the official co-op, uh, when they came up, the existing law was six months as a wage laborer, then you have to be brought into the cooperative itself. Um, and so that was happened. So the sad story there is that it ended up, they ended up being fired shortly before six months was up. Um, so that was the self-interest you know, of this small group, um, which is, I think, a problem that you have to talk about when we talk about cooperatives. There was another company, similar story. Um, and in that case, at a key point, the, the is very strongly political in terms of this organization. In that in that case, the, the uh, cooperatives, this is a company called Invaval, which provided type pipes for the oil company. Um, they said, we're not going to repeat or renew our cooperative papers. We think there should be 100% state ownership, 100% workers' control. Um, mm. And so that reflected the ideology that had been built up of solidarity in the one case versus self-interest in the other case. And I think that's a question that has to be looked at in all talks of cooperatives. Um, and, you know, like to talk about as well, um, the, the Yugoslav experience, um, which I studied there too, which is state ownership or social ownership, but controlled juridically by workers. The, yeah, I mean, that brings to my mind the kind of question, the, like a deep question I have, because I think what you find is, is I think, in the cooperative sector, you're gonna, you find a group of people who are really interested in developing cooperatives for a number of different reasons, but maybe not specifically political reasons. And they're just like for their own sort of sake, because they're good and they're, they're interesting or something like that. Then you have people who are very political and on the left, on the radical left, who are very much not interested in cooperatives using, you know, traditional Rosa Luxemburg and even, you know, some things from Marx in terms of the criticism of cooperatives, even a little bit that you mentioned that, you know, they're within, they develop within the capitalist system. And so they have, they have to deal with the situation of capitalism and the competition that arises there from and stuff like that. I think on this show, we've tried to find a middle ground that, that it is suggests that there can be a role for cooperatives in terms of, um, you know, the, like you said, the sort of the process of manage management and worker control of actual industries and things like that. But if it's disconnected from a larger political project, <laughs> then it's it's not just going to like somehow you can't just like grow the cooperative sector until one day we have socialism and you can't ignore co like workers owning and controlling their the means of production at least in you know isolated areas if you're engaging in a political struggle for socialism and so i'm curious to 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 sort of pick your brain about the relationship between the sort of political and the economic uh you know two sides of this in terms of um, 
the if you look at something like you know Venezuela, there was obviously a political movement that had had multifaceted positions in terms of wanting to develop a social economy and specifically focused on uh, cooperatives, but also like housing and, and different you know different areas, um, education, all that kind of stuff. Some of that being real, very specifically state con- owned, controlled, and, and oriented, and then the cooperative sort of development. So there is this conflict, I feel, between this approach of like pure state ownership and control and pure like workers control. And there there has to be some kind of mix of, of, of a relationship between those two. But that's always been for me a bit difficult to tease out what that relationship really should be to make sure that we're not missing the ball on either side of that. And I think as somebody who's both had a lot of theoretical, you know, like, um, work on this and also actually on the ground, you know, there is, as you described, the Yugoslav model of state ownership, kind of worker management. And then there's a, a model of pure state control and state management in terms of, you know, the Soviet Union and um, and th- some, you know, attempts at creating at least a kind of a co- parts of an economy, like in Emilia Romana or Mondragon even itself, of trying to do it without grasping state control. So I'm, I'm wondering just how you think about this um, from that kind of larger theoretical perspective. Well, I think it's wrong to focus on the question of ownership, um, juridical ownership, certainly. Um, the question in, the, in Yugoslavia was when they called them Yug- social enterprises or socially owned property, um, what was left for the state? What did it mean that the state you know, owned. It meant that workers could not sell the means of production. Um, it meant that they were trustees of the means of production. But it didn't mean that they, you know, that state ownership prevented them from being able juridically to make the decisions in the workplace that were necessary. Um, so it, it isn't quite, certainly there was a political thrust in Venezuela. It was a political thrust in Yugoslavia, but what was missing in in Yugoslavia, for example, was that while each enterprise was engaged in basically serving their self-interest, um, they, their point was to maximize income per worker, um, and insofar as their main focus was self-interest, and this was not simply this was in, encouraged by the, the League of Communists. The, the Communist Party of, of Yugoslavia, that they should engage in, because the lower phase of socialism, you know, means emphasis on self-interest, you know, to each according to his contribution, that the that was the, you know, the focus, the, that was one of the problems in, in Yugoslavia. But beyond simply the question of let us impose a progressive ideology on the people and therefore everything will go well. What was missing, I would argue, and I, I've, I've read some uh, Yugoslav writers who would agree, that what was missing essentially was a commitment to the society, a commitment to the community, and in so far as this commitment to the community could, you know, the, 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 effectively the, the workers could, and the workers' councils could work with a counterpart of their local communities. Um, and, you know, that was certainly something that this second um, case in Venezuela of Invaval Inva um, was involved in. They, as their workers' council, which was politically advanced, uh, made contact with the communal councils in their area and asked, how can we serve you? This was particularly true because they were having difficulty selling their pipes to Petavesa, the oil company. Presumably, it was never exactly proven because they weren't doing like the co- company had previously done, bribing the officers of Petavesa. Uh, mm. So they didn't ha- have the sales that they could have had. So they turned to the community and said, what can we do you know, to serve you and to serve ourselves in that process. That's, I think, an essential element is workers' councils or co-ops by themselves, you know, absent from a commitment to the society in some form, in fact, you know, do not, you know, develop the potential 
of, of what cooperatives can do in this process of development in the direction of socialism. That's that's, uh, yeah. Yeah, that's fascinating. Yeah, that's been the, I think the 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 thing for me is that you, you'll find a lot of people who want to develop ind individual co-ops for for their own sake. But you know, yeah, in the sense like, all right, if the state oil company is not buying our pipes, like, can we do the sewer? Can we do something else? You know, like there's there's obviously a lot of need, especially in a in a more developing area like Venezuela for that kind of work. And so making those connections are, I think, in some ways too, in terms of even growing. A larger interest in a co-op if the co-op is actually doing something for the community then people see it as as a as a potential alternative to simply looking for the state for everything and that 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 you begin to develop a, a you know, less traditional you know bourgeois liberal kind of relationship to to the state and you're talking about more local connections and decentralized connections that are made between these representative bodies of individuals in whether it be a community a school uh you know or a, or an enterprise of some kind it seems to make yeah, perfect I, sense to me I, th I think that's you know uh, essential you know and that has to be i think part of you know the 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 perspective of people who are focused on co-ops um, the necessity to to go beyond the focus on self-interest that another aspect in venezuela in yugoslavia was that the problem that they faced um, was that um, even though the expectation, and certainly Marshall Tito had said, when you have workers' councils, people will learn, et cetera, how to run the factories, et cetera, like that, it didn't happen really. And the reason it didn't happen was because workers, even though they had juridical power uh, in the workplace, they didn't have the knowledge uh, to be able to do this. Um, so, for example, there were experts. There was the manager. The manager would come forward with, you know, the the proposal for what products to sell, you know, what, um, how much to put aside for investment, etc. And the workers' council would rubber stamp it because their view was, well, these are the experts. We don't really know. We know how to work well. Uh, but we don't have the expertise to do this, etc. And one writer in, in Yugoslavia said, well, you know, the problem was they'd work a hard, you know, 40 hour week, etc. And then they didn't have time to learn this process. So based on that knowledge, one of the proposals we made in Venezuela, hmm. when there was discussions of lowering the workday, was to say, no, we have to transform the workday, move it from eight hours to six hours, with the two hours being used for training in accounting, in management, in all these marketing issues, et cetera, like that. Um, and, okay, well, here is a question. Chavez was interested in this idea, but yeah. the trade unions were not. Uh, yeah. The trade unions said, okay, yes, let's reduce the workday, but rather than and, and just you know, reduce it. We'll go home earlier. Or even better, let's have four-day weeks, you know, and then we'll have longer weekends, et cetera. <laughs> and so there was no pressure from the unions, you know, and there's, in fact, that general uh, that general disregard for anything of that kind. But that is not inherent in unions. That was certainly something characteristic of the unions that emerged in this rentier you know, you know, capitalism, um, in which the whole thing was, how do we get the rent? You know, um, and that was that was the focus of the unions there. Not all of them. Right. There were some right. really good unions, but they were the minority. Right. Yeah, yeah. I just as a comment, I mean, I think we've talked about. Um, yeah. Uh, well, I think Lenin said this. This is a, maybe apocryphal or something, but that. Uh, you know, we've got a revolution. Why can't why can't our work? You know, why doesn't anybody understand accounting? <laughs> that you know, the workers have to do that if they're going to be able to make enterprise level decisions. Yeah, uh, I, I can't remember the exact quote from Lenin, but it was you know that that was okay. the goal, the ideal that every yeah. cook could do this. Yeah, but also uh, from the perspective of the co-op, uh, the I mean, I have this fear that co-ops have been given this opportunity hopefully it'll be democratic 
if you create their own enterprises, uh, because our society is sort of cracking a bit, you know, so a lot of people are in municipalities and whatnot are kind of desperate to try different things, but, you know, it could all be attacked eventually or squeezed out financially. And mm. it's really important, I think, to uh, for co-ops to start making just marketing connections, helping the community by serving them with products, getting ideas from them about what they want, and so that they'll have some defense <laughs> if times come or if political pressure or financial pressure starts, you know, coming down on them, that um, so many movements have like, Occupy even was you know, great well, you spontaneous know, thing, but it fades. Doesn't have an institutional basis, but at the same, and part of that institutional basis is not just what you're doing, you know, either politically or economically. It's you've got to join the two, and the community itself is is a close and it's right there for you. If you recognize the importance of working with the community, right. um, there, there, you know. I think that there is the problem, something that Che Guevara stressed, which was the pipe dream that you can get to the new society, you know, with material interest, you know, is, is leads you into a dead end and that, that, and you don't know where you went wrong. You can't find it. That's not the exact quote. I could give you the exact quote if you need it, but um, the, the focus on self-interest in Yugoslavia meant, um, that they said, well, how are we going to, you know, get the highest possible income? We get it by listening to the people who will help us do it because their interest is the same as ours. It's higher income for the for the enterprise, et cetera. Um, and one of the issues, and, and because they um, effectively did not have the knowledge uh, because there was transparency, but they didn't have the ability to work with that those records, et cetera, to make the right decisions. What you have is a devolution of workers' control and workers' counsel to, in fact, a process in which there are those who are, who make effectively the decisions and those who are um, not. It's the conductor conducted and process. For the money. Yeah. And isn't this, yeah, this is the new class, right, that, that GLOS talked about and uh, like, to a certain degree. I think it's uh, it took it a little too far or something. But, like, there is there was this idea that almost there becomes this new division of labor and a new position where, the yeah, the state might own, as you were talking about, but the owning is just a different, but there's this managerial class that, that you see emerge in, in, you know, structures that are not, are not intending to raise up that bottom and, and make everybody, you know, make the cook and the gender, the, the also able to look at the books. And so that when you have open books, everybody knows what's going on is that you, you essentially reify a, a class kind of division in terms of who's actually operating and making the decisions and then just who's doing the work and getting paid. Right. Uh, exactly. But there is within given a process of self-interest in each of these, enterprises, it meant that they were also competing against each other, you know, and that, and that again was something that Che posed quite early when visiting, you know, Yugoslavia in 1960, saying, well, I mean, here's a, how does this build the socialist society when workers are competing with each other? And that's one aspect of the, the problem of self-interest. But there's a, another, which is this tendency, I think, for enterprises, co-ops, uh, worker you know, controlled enterprises to in fact juridically controlled to in fact devolve into that same kind of question of those who know and those who don't know. Um, and I think that, you know, and because there is a focus of you're living in, co in a competitive society and you're oriented toward, you know, income, um, that there is a tendency under these circumstances, I think, for, you know, to move away from worker management to, in fact, a more traditional model, even though it's not, you know, exactly the same. Uh, I think that's what happened in uh, Argentina with a number of the co-ops that were established there. Um, and it certainly um, 
I I am also of the oppression, but I haven't followed it up enough that that effectively also has occurred in in uh, Mondragon, that the workers, you know, while they have this sense of themselves and and as being the the ultimate decision makers, that they are not in motion in terms of the protagonism in developing the you know those enterprises. It's the managers. It's a group of pe people at the top. And, and there is a writer, um, I forget her name, um, who wrote a book on the myth of Bondragon, um, which talks about how this, the, the different consciousnesses that developed you know, within those enterprises. Chinar, I haven't heard no, that's, uh, oh, yeah, the title is enough, that, I think. Uh, yeah, yeah. That's very interesting. And, and uh, Michael, I think when we were referring to Che, I think he was thinking about creating the new human being or the moral human being, right? That would, you know, not only think of the self-interest, but actually have the community in mind and actually be uh, happy and, and convinced in working with the community and, and, and sacrificing the community at large. And I think that's kind of the experiment that you've been working in and what you've been doing. And practically, I was just curious, you, you mentioned elements of this, I think, but I wanted to see on the ground, you've done this in Venezuela to a great extent. And I just was curious to see how this has developed with regards to you know the communal aspect of it worker ownership um and production for for social needs these these kind of i think what they call the or what chavez called the elementary triangle of socialism in 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 venezuela how did how did that how did that play out um and and kind of where do you see it going well first of all recognize that that elementary triangle is like a a goal. Um, it's not was not necessarily in practice. What was happening was a process in each of these cases unevenly of in that direction. Certainly, there was the emphasis on social ownership, uh, the nationalization or the, the deprivatization of a number of firms that had been privatized in the preceding period, um, and certainly there was also um, the you know, production for social needs in the sense that the activities in the in the com communes, the well, the count the councils first, and then the communes has been and was the most exciting part of Venezuela. Um, and right now, uh, it, it, you can see this if you go to Venezuela Analysis, uh, which is a great site which emphasizes you know a lot the discussions and interviews with people in the communes. Um, there, the, Chavism lives in the communes these days. Uh, it does not in the state. Um, in fact, there's been, you know, one of the problems, again, because things don't drop from the sky, you know, um, to a tabla rosa, you know, what you had, you know, in Venezuela was a long tradition of, you know, corruption and clientelism all linked to the oil revenue. Um, and so that process, you know, people would join the party of the time in order to move up, in order to have better access to the rents, et cetera. Okay, that culture, you know, I, I wrote about this, I think in my, in my book, Build It Now, which was, this was the last possible place under these cultural conditions to imagine socialism being built. And in fact, you know, the emergence of Chavez with his strong emphasis on protagonism, uh, that, you know, it didn't, it didn't disappear, all these, this cultural issue. So that, you know, that was the problem. Um, and again, right now, you know, the Maduro government is basically engaged in trying to do one, whatever it can to have the sanctions removed and doing, the, doing so by making overtures to the conservative or the bourgeois opposition, but in fact, challenging very strongly any of those on the left who say, this is contrary to Chavez, this is moving back to capitalism, et cetera. And those people, as in the last uh, elections, have no access to state TV. And in fact, in, in some cases were uh, attacked physically, you know, in, in running candidates. And it, it was what's called the popular revolutionary alternative and the communes and the co-ops oh. like when people are talking about you know the, the failed nature of venezuela and stuff right now like the the thing that i do come back on is like i think i'd be curious your position is not only does that there's like you know chavismo 
uh, live on in in uh, in the communes, but it, they're actually still working. That that the the re, you know the relationship between the cooperatives and and communes and those things are there's still a vibrant tradition and 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 existence of democratic participation, economic activity, despite all of the you know the difficulties generally in terms of great inflation and all that kind of stuff. That that there's because there is that connection, whatever connection was built between the community and the co-ops, they're still able to provide a lot of you know the basic needs and things like that 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 allow people to kind of continue on and maybe you're not flourishing in the way that you might if you were not under a massive sanctions regimes which hasn't changed from trump to biden we should probably be should be clear about that um uh Our so earlier. like th- it's always been to me like if you're really talking about the the socialism in venezuela you shouldn't be looking at the state-owned oil company and or even the the Maduro government. What you should be looking at is the communes, and those are working. Yes, um, and uh, they're very exciting. Uh, they are. They work out some of the best ones, the ones that are most developed. Um, and I can't remember the uh, offhand the uh, name, but there is an article I think that covers this recently in Monthly Review um, by. I, I think Kelly. it's. I, th- I think it's the El El Maizal. In Maisel commune, probably. Yeah, that's right. Exactly. Yeah. That's the one. Uh, yeah. They've made links with other cooperatives. They have exchanges, you know, uh, on, you know, not on prices, et cetera. They are having difficulties, but the main difficulty is the difficulty in getting uh, fuel uh, to run tractors, et cetera. Um, and that's, that's the main problem at this time. Um, but they are, they're, they're really exciting, you know. Awesome. Well, so, uh, we're running up to the end of the time. time. It's going to kick about, us out. Uh, just last thought. It's not right. of mine. It's just, this might be super hard, but uh, so we've been talking about you know, Venezuela and uh, Latin America, Yugoslavia. Uh, would I be wrong in saying that one of the big messages that, from your experience that might apply to what's the co-op development desire efforts that are happening on piecemeal basis in this country is don't think just co-op the education in the, the I don't know joie de vivre or spirit of uh, ultimately becoming uh, a full member of your community and uh, working and believing that that's a possibility not just through your own efforts, but as part of the building of the co-op and uh, connections with the community that the it's almost emotional in a way, not just yeah. juridical. Can Is I, that can gone I, too far? <laughs> no, no, I want to just emphasize something, um, which is Marta Harnecker, my wife and I um, went, you know, became advocates of socialism for the 21st century. And we developed a program in Cuba, where, and Cuba is certainly a top-down process, even though there's substantial participation in discussing the ideas of the party, um, but not anything coming from below. Our proposal was to create a socialism for the 21st century, which would involve stressing worker management, cooperatives, and and um, the question of communal control, much like the model in Venezuela was sent, uh, uh-huh. set up. And that's what we, and we gave talks, we just published about five small booklets, et cetera, on what is socialism for the 21st century. And a number of good, strong party members that we knew in Cuba were very attracted to this. Um, and. We hope that, that those ideas will bear fruit at some point, or I do at this point, because Mark is gone. <laughs> Me well, we too. Should, we should look at them ourselves, if we haven't already, or some of us haven't. I haven't. Well, I had an How article in Monthly Review called, What is Socialism for the 21st Century? You can okay, find right. it somewhere. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. There's also a great talk on my, my website. It's on my website. Yep. You can find a lot of good stuff on YouTube. I, I, I devoured a lot of stuff that I've found of yours, uh, Michael, on, on YouTube. I was like, oh, yeah. This is speaking right. my language. I, I loved right. it. Okay, so hey, I hope yeah. I haven't. I hope okay. I haven't discouraged the co-op model. <laughs> no, 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 I think you no, encouraged you it. Or, uh, you're great. Yeah, you, you, you've yeah, expanded it beyond yeah. the walls of the co-op, and that's what's yeah. needed. Yeah, it's not that's not right. self-interest, social interest. Yeah, we need yeah. to have that as our focus for sure. But that's a process. It doesn't happen overnight. No, yep, it doesn't. 
Yep. Uh, took took so capitalism a long time to develop too, and and long time to develop the institutions and the theory and all that kind of stuff. And so it's going to take this a while too. And the 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 we just have to be intentional about it. And you know, yeah, we not don't have within, that, not, not, not with the crisis of the Earth system. We don't have well, that yeah, time. right. We don't have the time. You're right. Yeah, and the world's on fire, so it's time to need to put it out. And the co-op is the co the social co-op and the social economy with uh, the orientation towards. Uh, actually fulfilling needs rather than making shit we don't need is going to be the thing that we need to do. Yeah. <laughs> Michael, okay, thank great, you so much. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Michael. Michael. Thanks. Thanks for joining us. Bye -bye. Really. Take it easy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. One minute. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Talk to Thanks for listening to this episode of All Things Co-op. To learn more about All Things Co-op, check out our webpage at democracyatwork.info slash ATC. And if you enjoyed this podcast and want to help support it, please go to patreon.com slash allthingscoop to contribute any amount that works for you.